Um, of course, you know, everything in here in the museum is kind of, uh, you know, somewhat directly inspired by this man, um, who is uh, P.T. Barney. You know, he was oh, yeah. the original uh, showman who would, you know, he used to actually have, this is a, a photo of his Bonham uh, American Museum in, in New York that burned down, unfortunately. But, um, you know, he would show all sorts of interesting things, and that's what the, the Museum of the Weird really is. is it's kind of a, a dime museum, which is what he what had. Um, and, and, you know, Barnum would mix in, you know, real facts, uh, like real live animals, as well as, you know, gaps, you know, like the, uh, the Fiji mermaid here. This is our Fiji mermaid. This is a uh, an illustration of what, you know, Barnum's looked like, but, um, you know, it's probably one of the most famous, if not the most famous, uh, hoax in, in history. And that was the, uh, uh, his uh, Fiji mermaid, which was, you know, at the time, it was funny, um, people, even at the time, you know, were like split divided on it. They were, they were not ever believed in this. They thought like, oh, it's got to be a fake, you know, it's got to be some kind of taxidermy creation or something. Um, and what Barnum did, which was ingenious, is he would actually uh, write letters or have people posing as um, scientists and writing letters into the local newspapers from, different, from opposing points of view, you know, like one of them would say, you know, this is a real creature from the depths of the seas, and it's amazing, you know, we should go and check it out. And then another guy, who Barnum would also hire, would go in and say the opposite and say, of course this is a hoax, you know, Barnum's up to his own tricks or whatever. And he would do this to generate, you know, publicity. Controlled opposition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, which is pretty ingenious. Yes. But, um, and, and even when Barnum got a hold of the, the, uh, the mermaid, it was... It had already been ex in existence for several decades before then. In fact, uh, this newspaper here is one of the um, original newspapers advertising Barnum's mer Mermaid right there. And you can see in the, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the illustration is a beautiful half-naked mermaid. <laughs> and that's what people <laughs> were paying, expecting to see this. And of course they go in and see this horrible looking uh, piece. <laughs> so we, we do mix in reality with fiction here. I don't tell people what's real, what's not, because I want them to come to their own conclusions. Very. You know, I think cool. that's important to let people, um, you know, kind of investigate on their own and come to their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. Because if uh, and I found actually, you know, well, there are some people like that who come in. An amazing number of people. It's split. Half of them believe everything in here. They'll believe every single thing, including the fur bearing trout <laughs> and, the, and the jackalope. And, the jackalope. And, and, and without, you know, even giving a critical thought about it, they believe everything. The other half, interestingly enough, doesn't believe any of it. Don't they think believe it, one thing. They think <laughs> There's no in between. Is, even when they look, they look <laughs> face to face with a real, you know, Peruvian mummy or something else that I've got here that are, that's real. They think it's fake, and and so <laughs> I think you know, and I, so I, I was like, and I, it would frustrate me in, in the beginning because I was like, that they, they, they don't even believe that the real thing is real. And they don't know how much that cost you. So I, but, so I, I, I realized, you know what? Though that's what it is. That's part of the fun, and and that's uh -huh. also it's it's a real interesting statement on uh, the way we think, psychology. You know, definitely the, 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 the human animals. Um, you know, but but um. I, I, I do my best. I don't tell people what's real and what's not. I use, let them, uh, I, I actually encourage them to further investigate on their own and, and maybe come to their own conclusions afterwards. Very cool. So, so um, because I think that's what it's all about. You know? It's like we can't take everything for face value, but at the same time, we can't be so um, skeptical that we miss the truth when it's right in front of our face. If you ever wondered what Patty's footprints, you know, Patty the, uh, from the Patterson Dune footage, uh -huh. th these are the actual prints that were taken uh, at the, uh, the film site when, uh, wow. when they were filming uh, the, the creature. So, like, these, these were basically tracks that they took from that creature. But, you know, the interesting thing, as far as the, these prints go, um, and this is actually, I think, are pretty similar to those down there, as well as this one. Um, you know, these others, I'm not so sure about those. These two on the left side there, by the way, are from East Texas. Supposedly there's a, uh, you know, that you've heard the story of the, the, the Boggy Creek monster, the Fountain monster and all that. Oh, yes. These are prints uh, from 
the uh, Sabine River bottoms. Uh, actually, uh, Chester Moore's group uh, mm -hmm. took these, and that's I think that's a half a print right there. So it's probably just a front half. But you can see it's got the three toes, and that was the one things the, that they were talking about in the um, Falcon series. They had, there were these three-toed prints, which was kind of unusual. Like, you know, no animal really has three toes like, as far as primates. That's a Gigantopithecus skull. Um, this was recommissioned by Dr. Grover Krantz, who is now deceased, but he actually had this thing made from just, I think, a, a fragment of the jaw, and maybe a few molars, and they were able to reconstruct the whole skull. But you could see, comparing the modern human with a lowland gorilla, compared to that to the Gigantopithecus, you know, if there is, if these creatures still exist today, maybe that's what people are seeing, maybe that's what they're reporting. Mm -hmm. you know, Maybe so. so. So, this is the Minnesota Ice Man. Now, there's uh, you know, a couple of things before before we start. I'll, I'll let you, uh, you know, videotape it here. I just want, um, we don't want anyone taking photographs or video of the actual creature in ice. Uh, we like to keep that as a surprise for the officers and stuff. Yes. Um, but you can take a look around here and see our collection of hominid skulls. Um, there's a photo of uh, uh, Ivan Sanderson down there, who was the author of this book about the Snow Snowman. And Sanderson, his link with the Minnesota Iceman was he was pretty much the one, besides Terry Cullen, who brought it to his attention. Him and Bernard Hovelmans were the two that actually blew the lid off of the story on the Minnesota Iceman back in 1969. Um, they actually did get to investigate it in 1968, uh, December. Um, the way the story, well, first I'll tell you about my my um, connection to the Iceman, because I actually do have a personal connection to this. Um, when I was five years old, it was probably about five, um, it was like early, mid-70s, my aunt took me to see this thing. Uh, I, I remember it vividly because it's probably my, one of my earliest vivid memories that I have. Um, there was a truck parked on the side of the road. It was actually uh, in a Kmart parking lot in our little town in Homestead, Pennsylvania. And I remember we went up to him, she paid him some money, and we went up to the side of the stairs and inside the truck, and one side of the truck was open, so you could see all the people looking in from the outside. But I remember once we got inside, there was just people looking down at the ice, like with this look of amazement and astonishment. <laughs> and I was like, you know, and I was only five, so I was about maybe that tall, and I couldn't see. And I was like, I can't see, I can't see. So my aunt's like, you know, she called me down to right about this spot here. And she goes, okay, right here, jump up here. And I lifted myself up and I came face to face <laughs> with what you're about to see here in a minute. But it really had such an impact on me that I was forever changed. I mean, had I not seen this, I, I can honestly say we wouldn't be here today because it probably wouldn't be a museum of the weird. And I wouldn't have gotten involved and interested in things like cryptozoology or any of the mysteries, the great mysteries. That's what's that's what drives me. It's like you know, kind of you know, people have kind of compared me to like Indiana Jones or something. No, not really. I'm, I'm <laughs> I think I'm more like a, a Fox Mulder. I the truth is out there. You know, that's my uh -huh. thing. I was like, I want to know what the truth is. I want to know. I'm I'm fascinated with all these mysteries, and especially you know, if they're you know Bigfoot. I mean, that's like one of my biggest dreams is to come face to face with a live Sasquatch somewhere. You know. So this all this is what started it for me was uh, getting to see this as a young kid. So and my life's never been the same. I didn't realize was when I saw this, I was actually probably one of the last people to get to lay eyes on the Iceman because shortly after I got to see it, um, Frank Hansen, the man who owned it and was taking it around the country, decided he wasn't going to tour with it anymore. He stopped. He just disappeared basically with the Iceman. And nobody's known what happened to it for the last. 30 something, 35 years or so, and it's actually been featured on shows like Unsolved Mysteries and uh, magazine articles and stuff. And it was a big mystery where was this thing? What happened to it? You know, where, where's the Iceman? And that's when I became fascinated because, you know, back then, you know, 
we didn't have the internet. This wasn't in books, really. I mean, you couldn't really. I mean, it was there was a book actually, but it was in French. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, you couldn't really find information like that. Right. And so, you know, I, I started researching it, studying it, and it was, and I was surprised to find that it was. You know, not just me, but hundreds, thousands of other people saw this back in the late '60s and 1970s, all the way up until like the early '80s. And I became like obsessed with it. I became really uh, like seriously. This became my obsession. And I was, I always thought like, wow, wouldn't it be awesome to like track down the Minnesota Iceman and, and, and bring it back here to put up in the museum? And I even thought like, well, where the heck would I put it? You know, in space. <laughs> you know, what would I do with it? And if it's even out there. And uh, I did, you know, purchase it just a few months ago. I don't know if you read any of the news articles and stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, they, um, uh, it was on a TV show called Shipping Wars, which mm -hmm. they were the ones who kind of initially, you know, showed the the episode where I got because I needed to get this thing shipped. It was, it was all this time it was still up in Minnesota, and um, so I contacted them. They, uh, they were like, oh yeah, this this is great. They uh, got this shipped to me. And uh, that whole thing was an adventure. They, they cut it down to eight minutes, but there was a, a lot of cool stuff that happened on that road trip. Um, but then when I, uh, you know, after I got here and they aired, you know, I couldn't say anything about this, of course, because I was, uh, I had signed a non-disclosure agreement, so we couldn't even mention anything about the Iceman. And um, when, as soon as the episode aired, you know, we announced it, we put out a press release, and within like two or three days, it was all over the news. Actually, the Huffington Post uh, contacted me. They were the initial ones that did the you know, big article. And that was the one that just kind of blew it up. You know, like, so, and I knew it was important, you know, because this really was, I mean, other than like my, um, I mean, I, I, one of the real reasons that I wanted this uh, so badly for the museum was I realized this is such an important uh, piece of our history. Definitely. That it needed to be shown to the public. Definitely. And, and my biggest fear was that, you know, um, if, if it, would, it would get lost again to some private collector or someone's private collection and we'd never see the light of day.